In addition to his uh, local pulpit work, he has held many gospel meetings, spoken on various lectureships and television and radio programs, and written for Christian publications, as well as local newspapers and church bulletins. He has taught song leading, conducted men's training classes, and founded and directed a youth camp. He has also served as an elder in two congregations where he preached. He and his wife, Jan, have been married since March of 1954. They have four children, five grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. I might add a personal note or two. Don is very special to my family and me. He was very, very good friends with my father while they were here uh, together. Don uh, and Dad used to run around and get into trouble together in Moundsville. Uh, and if you want to know more stories about that, just let me know. It's very good to see some of his family here uh, with him that I haven't seen in years. And it's very good to meet some other in-laws and things. We're very pleased that you're here, Don. I might uh, also say that Don was here about the time, I think you came about the time I was eight years old and left town when I became a teenager. I don't know if I had anything to do with that decision or not, but uh, we appreciate you uh, being here with us today, Don, very, very much. Half of what he said is true. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for that introduction. It's true that I uh, was blessed to work with this congregation early in the 1970s. And uh, the first family that I became acquainted with was the Robison family. There's an interesting story behind my coming here that I have only shared with a very few people. I don't know if I've ever told this here or not. I don't know if I've even told members of my family, except for Jan. But we were working with a congregation over in Central Ohio when it came time to move on after several years there. And um, I was inquiring about churches that might need preachers. And uh, every one that I asked seemed to say, well, Hillview Terrace in Moundsville, West Virginia, is wanting a preacher. Well, that was a little bit above my uh, capabilities, I thought. I'd heard so many great things about the work at Hillview Terrace and Moundsville, West Virginia, and the work that Brother Gene West had done. And so I was really reluctant to notify them and let them know of my interest in the work here. And Finally, one day I got a telephone call, and I don't remember who it was that called me, telling me that one of my best preacher friends, Brother Flavel Miller, who was preaching at Millersburg at that time, had died. I was shocked. I didn't even know he had been sick. And so I decided that <coughs> I would call uh, his uh, wife, Ramona, and express our condolences. And I got up the nerve to dial the number, and who answered the phone but Flavel Miller? What do you say <laughs> in a moment like that? I stuttered, and I stammered for a while, and I said, well, Flavel, do you know of a church needing a preacher? And he said, yes, I do. And he mentioned Hillview Terrace in Moundsville, West Virginia. It just so happened that his uh, wife's parents, Gay and Maggie Sweeney, were members of this congregation. And he knew of the uh, vacancy that was going to be here. And so he recommended this congregation to me. And somehow... I got Brother Gene West's telephone number, and I called him to see if it was true that he was leaving this work. I didn't want to apply unless he was, and he assured me that he had intended to move to another location and gave me the phone number of Brother uh, Jack Robinson. And we arranged to come here one Sunday, and we spent the afternoon with the Robinson family and uh, that included Jack and Elizabeth and Jennifer and Christy and, of course, uh, this other one, Andy. And, uh, <coughs> and we had a delightful time that afternoon. And going home that evening, 
I said to my wife, Jan, I said, if they invite us to come, I'm going. I, I just fell in love with the congregation at that time. And so a couple of days later, Brother Jack called me and invited us to come and locate with this work. And we were so blessed to have the two years to spend with this congregation and so many precious memories that we have. And we formed so many great friendships, not just here, but throughout Marshall County, that uh, friendships and memories that we cherish even to this day. And it's certainly a great pleasure and honor to stand here today and to try to speak to you about the subject that has been assigned to me. Uh, Denver and I used to talk a lot about Andy, and uh, of course, uh, as Andy said, he was quite young when I came here, and, and I left when he got to that troublesome age, and uh, Denver always said he had to deal with him in his teenage years, so uh, I avoided that, but the Robinson family meant so much to me and to Jan and our family. I had so many opportunities to grow spiritually while I was here under the guidance of a fine eldership of five men, and we had ten deacons, and one of those men is still here alive, and Brother Howard Soule was one of the elders at that time. Uh, while here, we had uh, a radio program. It began as a weekly program radio program and then developed into a daily radio program at noon over WEIF and it was there that I really became acquainted with uh, Brother Randy Chamberlain who was the uh, radio station manager. He and I became friends. Later I would uh, have the privilege of baptizing him in the Christ and now he's one of the elders of this church. So we have many things to thank God for and thank the brethren here for in enabling us to serve the Lord with them and to grow in that way. I feel honored to stand here before you today and to attempt to speak for a little while on the assignment, Psalm 112. I was talking to Brother Charles Pugh one time shortly after Andy had assigned me this topic and I said, Charles, uh, I, I don't have much in the way of resource uh, to draw from. I knew that Brother Thor had written two volumes on uh, Psalm, and I have both of them. But at that time, uh, the third volume, I don't believe, was out, and I didn't have access to it. And uh, so I was chiding Charles that he got a subject that he had some source of reference that he could go to, and I didn't. But anyway, I hope that I will be able to say something today that would be of help to us uh, as we advance uh, uh, as Christians and try to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. From our text... And let me just take the time to read that short psalm, if you will. The, in, the, in my uh, lectureship manuscript, they are all usually quotes from the New King James Version, but I'm reading uh, this morning from the uh, King James Version. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the name that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, the generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. 
He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His uh, uh, horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. From uh, the scripture, of course, we learn how important it is to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast. That's my subject this morning. God gives me steadfastness. And he's trusting in the Lord, verses 1 and 7. From the late beloved Leroy Brownlow, I would like to share these words. He said, and quote, The blessed of God are secure. I'm looking into the face of many in this audience, of all in this audience probably, who understand the blessedness of being steadfast in the Lord. I'm looking into an audience of steadfast people. As Andy might say, I'm preaching to the choir. I don't know what that means exactly, but it sounds good. And uh, it means that I'm speaking to the best, we would say the cream of the crop. Cream of the crop are gathered here today. Not that there aren't others who are just as steadfast throughout the brotherhood, but we all know that we are here gathered this morning because we love God, we love his word, and we have come to be taught further and edified and strengthened and built up in the most holy faith. Brother Leroy said, the blessed of God are secure. We're secure. That is, we're unshakable people. They are not chaff moved by wind. They are not driven by restlessness, frustration, and defeat. They are stable, solid, and firm because their roots are grounded in God and his word. End of quote. I put in the manuscript, at the risk of being labeled negative, I offer an opinion that in the church today, there is a short supply of steadfastness, a short supply. If you're inclined to disagree with me on that, <coughs> just consider the decline in number that the church has experienced in recent years. I was blessed to have begun preaching in an era in which the church was one of the fastest growing religious bodies in the United States. Brother Phil Greer and I were talking about that just yesterday evening, how that when we began preaching, you would preach a gospel sermon and almost invariably, someone would respond to the invitation and be baptized and be restored. I can't tell you the last time that I baptized somebody. Now, I know I live in an era, an area in which the church is small, and uh, we do not always make the impression upon our community that we might if we were larger in number, but it's almost that way. Everywhere you go anymore, churches are declining. They are declining rather than growing. We used to boast a membership of 2.5 million people. Only the Lord, of course, knows how many of those were really numbered in the book of life. But I am told 
that in the 2015 edition of Churches of Christ in the United States, and I have a copy, I haven't checked this, but I'm told that in this book compiled recently by century Christian, first century Christian, there are 45 fewer congregations of the Lord's people listed than in the previous edition, which, as I'm not mistaken, was maybe three or four years ago. We're not growing. We are declining in most places, not every place. Further evidence of the lack of steadfastness among many congregations is seen in the attendance figures. I would suggest that the number in attendance for Sunday morning Bible class is much less than the number in attendance at the worship hour. And the number of those attending Sunday evening is usually 40 to 50% shy of that seen at the morning hour. And the midweek service, the number present is even much smaller. I recently saw in a bulletin of one congregation in our area a Sunday morning attendance of 400, a large congregation, always above 300. But on that particular Sunday, there were 400. That evening, they had 16. Now, that's not a misprint in your book. That's from the church bulletin. 16. Now, I hasten to say, that in addition to the number who gathered at the church building that evening, they had a lot of small groups scattered throughout the area. In fact, we have one of their small groups that meets in Hugh Silos. I often wondered why they don't meet with us. We're a small group. <laughs> but anyway, that is only one example of uh, the decline that many congregations are experiencing. But the scriptures, of course, advise us that we are to be steadfast. Is that steadfast? Would they consider themselves steadfast, faithful to the Lord? Well, what is the cause of all this? Why do people not fear the Lord and delight in his commandments. Every faithful gospel preacher that I know and the godly elders that I know, they spend a great deal of time trying to persuade their membership to be faithful. They visit, they send letters, they pray, they plead, they beg for their membership to come back on Sunday evening and come on Wednesday evening to attend the Bible class on Sunday morning, most of the time it's always to no avail. Some of the brethren have tried just about everything imaginable, including some very extraordinary tactics to swell their attendance. I once knew a preacher. He's no longer preaching. In fact, he left the church. Maybe that's the reason, the lack of interest among members. He left the church. He left his family. But that preacher was working for a congregation up in Michigan, and I received their bulletins all the time. And so he made a challenge to the congregation that if Sunday morning attendance increased by a certain number, he would kiss a pig. And he wasn't talking about his wife. He said, I'll kiss a pig if we reach this plateau. They didn't. I don't know if he kissed the pig or not. So that didn't work. 
So in the next week or two, he issued another challenge they thought would be of more interest to the membership. He said, if we reach this plateau next Sunday, one of the elders is going to allow someone to dunk them in the baptistry. Such foolishness. Just an attempt to raise numbers. I don't know if that worked either because I, he quit sending me the bulletin after I wrote him a letter and chided him about it. I think that is the most ridiculous thing that we could ever try to do to increase attendance which, when all is said and done does not prove any steadfastness to the Lord. It doesn't show any fear for the Lord and it certainly doesn't show any adherence to his commandments. This passage tells us that we're to fear the Lord. I know that there are various uh, definitions to the word fear. And this is not the only place, of course, in the Holy Scriptures that we are told that we must fear God. That preacher of old, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Solomon, wrote, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Not only fear God, but keep his commandments. And he said, this is the whole duty of man. Now, some would dare to take issue with the inspired writers saying that God was such a loving God, he's such a gracious God, that we had no need to be afraid of him, no need to fear him. He loves us so much that he would never condemn us. He would certainly never kill us. And, of course, those who agently make such statements have not searched the scriptures very much or they would have seen various examples of God's severity in punishing the disobedient. When I was a child, I was blessed with Christian parents. Not only Christian parents, but I was blessed with grandparents and other relatives who were Christians, who set good examples before me. I had a father who was rather strict, I suppose, Looking back now, I realize that he wasn't probably as strict as he should have been. But I wasn't afraid of him. I, I was not afraid that he was going to abuse me, that he was going to beat me to death. He wasn't going to desert me, abandon me. He wasn't going to give up on me. And even when I was disobedient, he wasn't cruel to me when administering the appropriate punishment. But as I grew older, even upon becoming a man, I continued to fear him in this respect. I respected him. I respected him. You know, the scriptures say that we are to honor and obey our parents. I don't think that stops when we're 21. I think as long as our parents are living, we have a certain responsibility to give respect to them, honor and reverence to them. And we do that by living out the uh, commandments that they gave us. And in my case, they were commandments found in God's word. My parents were Christians. They wanted me to be a Christian. They wanted me to marry a Christian, and I did. And we together have produced some Christian daughters who have Christian husbands, and they have those children that have reached the age of accountability who are Christians. I had the privilege of baptizing some of them. So my father's will was God's will. 
that we be raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We had fear and we had respect for our father, both Denver and myself. This is precisely the kind of fear that we as Christians should have for our Heavenly Father. We love Him because He first loved us. 1 John 4, verse 19. We show our love for God by keeping His commandments. That's how we prove our love to God. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We must never lose sight of the truth that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrew 10, verse 31. However, we don't have fear if we obey him. We have no reason to fear him or to be afraid. Our heart must be steadfast. The psalm tells us that the man's heart is steadfast because he trusts in the Lord. Blessings from God are promised as a reward. Throughout the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, found promises of God toward his faithful children. And we know his promises are true. The Apostle Peter said he's not slack concerning his promises. Evidences of his promises being given are carried out, but God found examples both in the Old Testament and the New. But that, those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. They serve as assurance to those of us who are endeavoring to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, and by doing this, we're able to look forward to the glorious appearing of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, verses 12 and 13. What do we mean by steadfastness? Let us first appeal to the Usually reliable David Webster or Daniel Webster, who says that for one to be steadfast, he must be, number one, fixed in direction. The Apostle Paul was fixed. He had his eyes set on heaven. He said he doesn't look, he didn't look back, he looked forward, up. It is to be firm in purpose resolution, faith, third, unwavering, firmly established. And scholars who have searched the scriptures and are more capable than I provide us with meanings derived from the original language thereof seem to agree with Daniel Webster. James Strong informs us that being steadfast requires that one be sedentary, unmovable. Settled, steadfast. I have cited in the manuscript several examples of those of old who serve as examples of steadfastness. The first one of which, of course, is shown was Noah. Noah. I cannot think of the days of Noah described in Genesis chapter 6. They were evil days. Evil days. Sometimes people today ask, do you think the times of Noah were any worse than the times we live in today? Well, things have not changed a whole lot from the, time, from the days of Noah than today. <laughs> But the Bible says that things were so bad in those days that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continuously. Our loving and merciful God was sorry, the scriptures say, 
it repented him. He was sorry that he had even made man. It appears to me that those were some truly very wicked days. Uh, how did this affect Noah? Did he excuse himself and saying, well, you know, I'm being influenced by my environment, by my culture. So you'll have to excuse me if I do not measure up to that which is taught in the Word of God. A lot of people excuse themselves on that very basis. No, I didn't do that. Did he lose faith in God? No. Verse 9 of that same chapter tells us that Noah was a just man, perfect, that is, upright, mature in his generation. Noah walked with God. That's what the scripture says. Noah walked with God. He didn't follow the crowd. He didn't allow Satan to lead him astray. He walked with God. Abraham. How can we who are of the spiritual seed of Abraham forget the many examples of steadfastness found in this man's earthly journey beginning with Genesis chapter 12? He is called by God. Get out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, verse 11, or verse 1 of chapter 12. Remember, this is during the patriarchal age when God spake directly to man, Hebrews 1 and verse 1. Abraham was listening to the voice of one whom he had never seen. And he did... And he did not even know where he was going. God said, I'll show you where you're going. I'll take you there. And God furthermore said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Verses 2 and 3. That's us. Because Abraham was steadfast, you and I have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We owe a great deal to Abraham. He's a great Bible character. We must not forget his wife, Sarah. The other day, a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> I was preaching on Hebrews chapter 11, faith. And one of the good ladies came out and she said, I don't know why it is that you preachers, when you're preaching on Hebrews chapter 11, you mention Noah, you mention Abraham, you mention the, all those men, and you never talk about that woman. And I kind of jokingly said, you mean Rahab? <laughs> she said, no, I mean Sarah. Well, we do kind of overlook Sarah sometimes, don't we? Sarah, Abraham's wife, also had faith in God. It says that Sarah herself also conceived strength to conceive seed or received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Hebrew, uh, Abraham's faith and steadfastness was further confirmed, of course, when his, after his son of promise, Isaac, was born. And he had grown to some age. God tested Abraham. By saying to him, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. Again, Abraham obeyed God. That would have been a real challenge. 
to be asked to give up your only son, son of promise, Isaac. But receiving that promise sustained Abraham, and he remained steadfast. God's promise makes us steadfast. And, of course, the final one that I have mentioned in the manuscript is Job. How can we possibly think about steadfastness to God without thinking about his servant Job? I know that there are people in the world who probably don't even know who Job is, and, and they don't care. But we who are Christians, when we're being tried and tempted, each day of our lives are certain to think of Job when these troublesome times come our way, and they do come our way. Every one of us is going to be tried. Some might even suggest that Job was not a real person and that his name is just used to illustrate human suffering. However, the fact that there is a biblical book bearing his name should give us some indication of the importance of God's, uh, in God's scheme of things. And consider that he is mentioned by the prophet Ezekiel, 14, 14, and did not the inspired New Testament writer James tell us that we ought to remember, he said, you have heard of the perseverance or the patience of Job and seeing the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and mercy James 5 and verse 11 in the very first verse of that book of Job bearing his name it says and that man was blameless upright one who feared God and shunned evil but he was going to be tried he was obviously known for his integrity and his good works. But his perfect nature did not make him immune to trials. He was attacked by Satan himself. He accused Job of serving God only for personal gain. He was not only very righteous, but he was very rich. Time will not allow us to dwell specifically on all of this, but you remember as Bible students that Job was called upon to bear more than his share of heartaches. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. He had sores all over his body, abandonment by friends, and more. And I believe probably his steadfastness was really put to the ultimate test when his wife came to him and said, Do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, slide here. That helped me. Saying, Job, forget about God. Job's answer, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God? Shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Chapter 2, verse 10. In the end, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. Job acknowledged that all that he had came from the Lord, and he allowed that since God had freely given him all that he possessed, that God should be allowed also to take it away. Throughout all the trials, Job's attitude was expressed in these words, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Never did Job, like so many today, blame God. Catastrophes happen today, and the first words out of a lot of people's mouths is, Why does God allow this to happen? Why has God done this? Job said it's not God. Well, our time is nearly up, and you'll have to read the rest of it in the book. They're on the table. You can buy them. <laughs> Good book. In the resurrection chapter of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
The Apostle Paul, of course, reminds us as the rest of the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said that Christ had been seen by many witnesses, himself included. And he said, if Christ is not raised, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. And throughout that chapter, he emphasizes the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he reminds us of the sting of death, of grave. But he said there's a victory. And the victory is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in that final verse, chapter 15 and verse 58, the Apostle Paul says, therefore, that means what, on the basis of what I've said before, I want you to listen carefully. Therefore, brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And he said, in doing this, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I, as a gospel preacher, and you and I, all as Christians, have in our lifetime experienced difficulties. There have been times that have been very trying. Physical ailments, losses of loved ones, disappointments in brethren, even some like the Apostle Paul experienced. Well, I'll tell you, as I stand here today, and Jan and I talk about this often, Blessings of being a Christian are so great. In his Beatitudes, Jesus said we ought not to even flinch when we're persecuted. He said you're blessed when men revile you, even when they say evil things against you for my sake. He said, rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. Paul gave thanks for the privilege of suffering, but he said, my sufferings do not compare with the sufferings that Christ endured. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I'm here to tell you today that the greatest blessings that one can receive in this life are those spiritual blessings that are found only in Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 3. We are blessed, the writer of Revelation said, when we do his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. We must believe that Jesus, his son, that is God's son. We must be willing to repent of our sin. We must be willing to confess with our lips that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. We must be baptized for the remission of our sin. And we must be faithful even unto death if we are to receive the crown of life. If you wish to become a Christian, I hope that you will make your way forward this morning and let your desires be made known. And we'll be happy to assist you in that simple obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ as Brother Andy leads us in that song, number 191. Shall we stand?